You're certainly watching the most comprehensive bulletin in the country. My name is Wilson Buru and our sign language interpreter is Marisha Owiti. Now we get to start with some good news. It's officially back to school for students in public schools. That's right. And the eight-day teacher strike was called off after parties agreed to have the industrial court decide on the disputes. Teachers are now expected to return to work on Monday morning as the unions file their submissions in court next week. After seven hours of deliberations before Industrial Court Judge Ndumanderi, the fate of the teachers' strike was sealed. The unions, that is NAT and Coupet, call off the teachers' strike commenced on 5th January 2015 forthwith. For the avoidance of doubt, all teachers will resume teaching by Monday the 19th January 2015. But the decision did not come easy. When all parties met at the industrial court early Wednesday morning, a cautious optimism had filled the air. But when the closed door deliberations before Judge Nderi began, everyone's game face was on. The teachers' unions, Nat and Coupet, vowed to put up a united front against their employer, the Teachers' Service Commission, and the Ministry of Labor, both of whom were unrelenting over increasing teachers' basic salaries. Outside the private chambers, the anticipation was building. And after the first five hours of deliberating, all parties were sent to their corners to decide on the finality of the strike. Two more hours in the afternoon, and the ship was finally sailed. The parties have agreed to have the economic dispute adjudicated by the court. The NAT and Coupet will file their memorandum and, and serve by 19th January 2015. The employer TSC to file their memorandum and serve on or before the 26th of January 2015. The Central Planning and Monitoring Unit, that is CPMU, and SRC to file their reports within 10 days from 26th January 2015. After the long day in court, while Cabinet Secretary Kazungu can be dashed out, the teachers declared victory. It is going to mark the end of confusion and will open a new dawn for proper construction of collective bargaining agreements at all times. We want something which is going to last for eternity. We cannot be perennial strikers. While the teachers' unions see this as their round one win, the country can only wait to see whether the court's arbitration in this stalemate will be the long-lasting solution between the teachers and their employer. Asham Wilu, KTN, at the Industrial Court. Nancy, certainly some very good news for teachers and parents. Students uh, as uh, well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I meant uh, students and uh, parents, but the teachers have also said that this was a win for them. So tonight on the PQ, we're asking you, do you think that the teachers' strike was successful? Do you think that the teachers' strike was successful? Yes, they had said that they would not go back to work until an agreement had been reached to raise their salaries. Now this matter has been taken to court. With that in mind, do you think that the teachers' strike was successful is the question tonight. And you can give us your opinion by sending us an SMS on double two one double five, or you can tweet us at Wilson Buru, at Kachungira and at KTN Kenya. We look forward to hearing, you, uh, to hearing from you. And of course, we will let you know what the poll result is later on. Now, in a new twist, the police now say that DNA tests have confirmed that the body initially believed to be that of Meshakia Bay actually belongs to another man. And the man's family is now demanding for that body, KTN's Masi Kandie, with the details of that story. More grief and confusion, Saumu Yusuf mourns the news of the alleged death of her husband. The news being the latest development in the mystery surrounding the death of supposed ICC witness Mesha Kiebe. The serious crimes unit that took over the case last week gave its first report after results from the fingerprints analysis 
which they say identified the body as that of Yusuf Hussein from Sirwa Posta in Nandi County. Tulipofika sikuwa shua kama ilikuwa ni yeye ama ni si yeye. Sasa tukakuja tukoneshwa picha zile from the the time alitolewa kwa maji. Sikuweza mrecognize. Sasa tulipoingishwa huko ndani mali watu wana view board ndio nikamwangalia sura masikio mguu zote za Yusuf Yusuf's family claimed that their son, who was a Matatu conductor along Kapsabet Kisumu Road, was last seen on December 25th last year. They thought he was visiting members of their extended family, only to be informed by detectives of a body lying at the morgue on Tuesday. Okay, to Kiongane last to December, Deton don't miss a Masiezi Kumbuka about Munayam Toto Kwenda Shule. Sasa ikakuwa tukipata na mtoto akianza opening day tukutane tupeleke mtoto from there sasa tukua yongea tena Sasa ndio jana nikapigiwa simu nikaambiwa kuna mwili lipatikana na fingerprints zikaonesha ni sasa leo tukuja to confirm kama ni yeye Detectives say the biometric identification is 60% accurate and pointed out that a DNA test will give a 100% conclusive result, assuring both families that investigations will be thorough. With the biometric identification, when we got the identity of Yebe, it did not match. The fingerprints does not belong to Yebe. According to the, our database at National Registration Bureau, it gives out automatically whose fingerprints are those. And these are the fingerprints which made me to go and look for this person in the ground. At the Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital Mortuary, the wife says she was able to identify him through his body marks. But as the new development unraveled, these are the guys. Yebe's elder brother, Ben Yebe, maintained that the body belongs to their brother who went missing on the 28th December last year. We even rechecked that body today and we still, we were satisfied uh, owing to the various body structures and marks on the body that actually uh, makes reference to him. The body will remain at the morgue as further investigations continue, including DNA sampling with an expected report between Friday and Monday. Meshak went missing in Tarbo, Wasingishu County on December 28th last year, and a body which the family maintains belonged to their kin was retrieved from River Yala in Nandi on the 31st. A post-mortem report conducted at the Moy Teaching and Referral Eldoret Mortuary by the institution's pathologist indicated that the deceased succumbed to injuries inflicted on the head with a blunt object. Masi Kandia Katian was in Gishu County. That controversy deepens. Now, a six-year-old girl was found dead, stuffed in a bag in Campbell County, and it's believed that she was killed by her stepfather, who's currently on the run. KTN's Catherine Owando gives us more on this disturbing story. The home of Evenson Jow is engulfed in a haunting silence. At the back of the compound, women prepare for a funeral. The little ones help where they can, oblivious of the pain that fills their mother's heart. Jerry's mother recounts the horrid tale that began on Monday. Jerry's mother noticed that her eldest child had not come home and yet the other two had. Jerry was not Evenson's biological child, however he was the only father she knew. Jerry 
According to those who know him, Evenson is an irrational man who is easy to anger. Jerry's mother says he has contacted her since the incident and she fears for her life. Kiambu County Police have launched a manhunt for Evenson and report to have promising leads. Catherine Omwando, KTN. Very disturbing story indeed. Let's move on. And a senior commander in the Ugandan militia group, the Laws Resistance Army, is set to be sent to the International Criminal Court for trial. Captured rebel chief Dominic Ongwen has been wanted by the ICC for almost a decade, and Uganda's military now says that he will face charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the ICC. This decision, decision comes as an irony as Ugandan President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni had called for African nations to withdraw from the Rome Statute and thus the ICC. Sharon Momani reports. After almost a decade-long hunt for Dominic Ongwen, the LRA chief finally surrendered to U.S. forces at the Central African Republic last week. Ongwen faces charges including murder, enslavement, inhumane acts, and directing attacks against civilians. He will be tried at the International Criminal Court. Ugandan Army spokesman Paddy Ankunda made this announcement on Tuesday, thus ending speculation that Uganda might seek to try the rebel in its own court. But the ready decision by Uganda comes as a surprise to many following President Yoweri Museveni's public declaration of lack of faith in the ICC. <laughs> Chikau chijao. Nataka sisu wote toke kwenye koti hiyo ya wazungu wakaina koti yao. Speaking during the recent Jamuhuri Day celebrations in Nairobi, Museveni said that the ICC had conspired against Africa and wanted all African states to pull out of the court. Iyo koti niliunga mkono mwanzoni. Kwa sawa mimi ni muta mbaya napenda ni dhamu. Only that is exactly what the country has decided to do weeks later. Dominic Ongwen, considered by some to be a deputy to Lord's Resistance Army Chief Joseph Kony, is to be conveyed to The Hague by Central African Republic authorities. The LRA has been blamed for the slaughter of over 100,000 people and kidnapping of more than 60,000 children during a three-decade-long campaign across five Central African nations. Details on when the trial process will begin are yet to be communicated. Shalmo Mani, KTN. Let's bring it back to Kenya. Senate Speaker David Ekweathuro hopes that the impasse on the new security laws will be addressed soberly. Speaking exclusively to KTN, Ekweathuro says that the laws should not be a basis for dividing the nation. Here's part of that interview. To date, uh, what would you say is the single most achievement uh, for you as a Senate Speaker? I think the single most achievement... Uh, if I were to summarize, well, first is I think Kenyans have seen a house of sobriety, a house that uh, approaches issues uh, uh, on the basis of merits and demerits. And I think uh, to me uh, that is one contribution in terms of political discourse to this nation. Uh, at some point you were a member of URP. I don't know if you are still. I'm still a member of URP. That is my party. All right. So, uh, basing on that, and now that you are overseeing a house which has two sides, the opposition and uh, the government side, how would you say is uh, your 
your way of uh, maintaining neutrality and impartial when you are conducting business of the house. Now, you must make a distinction between you as a partisan member, which the speaker is not, because partisan members are on the floor of the house. The speaker has a constitutional duty to remain neutral, to guide the house on the basis of the constitution, the law, and the standing orders, which are like, if you may, if you may wish, uh, our, our operations manual. And really, if, if you believe in the fidelity of the law, you should have absolutely no problem uh, navigating that. In a, this is a democracy. Uh, as a speaker, you must ensure that uh, every side, every political uh, shade of opinion, every geographical uh, dimensions in a debate are, are brought to bear and they are hard. That, as I said in my acceptance speech, the majority uh, will have their way, but the minority must also have their say. Okay. Some quarters have accused you of uh, not being so partial in uh, and favoring the government side. Uh, I don't know how true that is. I am not aware of those quarters. They must be emanating from your quarter. <laughs> uh, I think the last, uh, so far, I have basically uh, been pleased that I've had uh, actually a good record of being an impartial speaker. I think what you are referring to is what happened uh, the last session, uh, the special session where uh, we convened the House because a matter that had already been made law was supposed to be discussed. And um, the procedures are very clear. Uh, the, the, the same matter was being uh, actively interrogated by uh, the High Court. And so under the rules of subjudice, we could not continue with the proceedings. So I, I don't even understand how you can accuse me of being biased. When all, I, all, all we just did is the, the standing orders are very clear, standing order number 92. That point was conversed on the floor, and convincingly so, uh, evidence was brought to justify that uh, the same declarations being sought are similar to the same resolutions being sought by the House. And, you know, for... This is one house that has fought for a mandate and space to be appreciated by other stakeholders. And uh, definitely the house felt is, is not also good for us to be the ones now taking that away from, uh, from other people. That matter is always open to come back when it is not under active consideration by the court. All right. And uh, on this particular bill, was there any consultation? There were consultations, yes. And uh, eventually you agreed that uh, it is a matter entirely to be dealt by the National Assembly. Well, I don't want to go into the details, uh, but uh, there were, we raised some concerns, and uh, which we said if those concerns were to be considered, then that matter may not affect the, the counties. But you know, in terms of uh, security matter, you know, this Senate is also a house for legislation, uh, for debate. So assuming we are not even legislating that particular matter, security affects counties. So I think it's important that uh, uh, the two houses should have had a uh, contribution to the, the bill. Yeah, those are the, the sentiments that, are, that are probably Senate is just duplicating roles of the National Assembly and uh, we really don't need a Senate. Do you think we, the Senate really needs to be enshrined in the Constitution? Well, of course, uh, presiding this institution, uh, every statement I make to that effect, I think I'm just protecting my own turf. But uh, a bicameral system is not unique to, to Kenya. There are many out of the Commonwealth, almost uh, three quarters of, of the Commonwealth countries have a bicameral system, including the mother parliament of uh, England. Uh, that, that question. Uh, has been there, the United States of America, the same, Canada, the same. Uh, what you need is uh, that even the two houses can be able to be a check on each other. Welcome back. You're watching KTN Prime. Now, President Uhuru Kenyatta has launched the fin enhanced rather, benefit of civil servants and disciplined forces medical insurance cover. The cover will, for the first time, enable those in the forces to access emergency medical services as well as specialized treatment. Here's a brief look at these and other stories from across the country. 
civil servants and members of the disciplined forces will now be able to call for emergency rescue services for evacuation in case of unexpected injuries suffered in the line of duty. This is after President Uhuru Kenyatta launched the enhanced medical insurance cover at the Wilson Airport Wednesday morning. He said the initiative would go a long way in ensuring more than 240,000 staff members benefit from the medical services. My government has shown its commitment to progressively ensuring access to quality and affordable health care with an initial focus on the poor and vulnerable members of the Kenyan population to enhance social protection. Elsewhere, the University of Nairobi has formally installed Professor Peter Mbithi as the seventh vice chancellor. This was at a ceremony held at the university's main campus, presided over by the chancellor, Dr. Vijo Ratansi. Professor Mbidi takes over from his predecessor, Professor George Magoha, who served as vice chancellor for 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the task ahead of us is challenging. Yet, the university will not relent in its endeavor to realize the horizon of opportunities for exploiting and competing with reputable universities worldwide. As we move forward into the future, we need to build synergies based on our various strengths and experiences. In Machakos County, operations of the Machakos Level 5 Hospital came to a standstill for the better part of the day after an irate crowd attacked the County Deputy Governor Bernard Kiala. Kiala had gone to the hospital to pick up his vehicle. It had been grounded following the scaffold between his supporters and those of Governor Alfred Mutua over medical services in the county. It took the intervention of the police to restore operations at the hospital. <laughs> And members of the Orange Democratic Movement were in Kajiado Central constituency to rally its supporters ahead of the by-elections slated for March 16th. The seat was left vacant after Joseph Nkaiseri was appointed Interior Cabinet Secretary. Timothy Otieno, KTN. Now it appears to be a new dawn for the residents of the areas along the Kisi Transmara border. This is after local leaders spearheaded peace talks to end long-standing hostilities between the, among the people of Kinango and Shankoe areas led by the governors of Narok and Kisi counties. The warring communities have promised to bury their hatchet. In their peace declaration, the two communities agreed to stamp out cattle theft along this border. It's perceived to be the main cause of the disputes. Tumekubaliana na governor tunai. Kwamba tuta create economic zone hapa. Na hiyo economic zone tuta keti na yeye. Tuta sign memorandum of understanding. Tukubaliana vila tunafanya biashara. Na sisi tukiwa hii generation ambaye sasa ndiyo wako uongozi. Lazima tuje tuongeze tu, tu, tuone ya kwamba. Iyo usiano memwa uleekwa na mababu zetu tu, tuifadhi ili watu waendele kuishi kwa mani. Mamba wakisema wale ana, ambawa hafikiri wakisema tutoe wakisi katika hapa ati nini, you don't know what you are, what you are doing. Ujui? Because these are resources, this is people you need to invest with you. The two communities have a history of conflict since 1992. Iyo tabia ya kuiba ngombe, nugu yangu umechelewa. You are living hundreds and hundreds of years. Nyuma. Munasimama hapa, munasema magava na wili wape njini kazi. Mumetoa gari, magurudumu, munambia wawa wa sukume. Na kwa kutoa magurudumu, ni kuleta hali ya taharuki. Speaker after speaker reminded the locals that peace at the border must be embraced by all. Kama wewe ndiyo ulichukua hiyo ngombe. Na watu wamepigana hivi wanakufa, wewe utatoa hiyo laana. Suji utaenda kanisa gani utuiga magoti usamehewe. Na tunaomba wase, na tunaomba DC ya bande hii, ya kisi, na, na DC ya kilgoris. Wale wase na simamia mbaka, uchungushe saasawa kama ne watu wanaangalia mambo ya amani.
The reconciliation is credited to the Council of Elders from both sides, which convened the peace meeting after intensive consultations from the leaders. Violence is costly, and as the two communities count big losses, it's upon them to stay in harmony so that to avert such big losses in the future. Fred Moturi, KTN, Transmara. Well, good evening and welcome to KTN Business. My name is Abi Agina, and we begin on a positive note. The Energy Regulatory Commission has announced the biggest reduction in fuel prices in four years since the introduction of fuel price controls. This comes amidst the global drop in oil prices, where crude oil dropped by $45 a barrel compared to $106 six months ago. With prices expected to drop even further in coming months, what impact is this likely to have on the economy? Katie's Charles Itonga has that story. I'm announcing the lowest prices ever in the regulation of prices uh, by the Commission. It is an announcement that comes as good news to motorists, industries and households as the Energy Regulatory Commission reveals that a litre of super petrol for the next one month will be 9 shillings and 13 cents cheaper. Diesel price has fallen by 7 shillings and 50 cents to retail at 83 shillings and 35 cents, while that of kerosene has dropped by 5 shillings and 78 cents to retail at 65 shillings and 59 cents. The new prices represent a 20% drop in general palm prices since September last year, and the ERC says this is a trend likely to continue in line with the falling global crude oil prices. However, there is a question as to why there seems to be a huge disparity between the drop in global crude oil prices and the local pump prices. In the last six months, the prices of crude oil have fallen by 58% to retail at 45 US dollars per barrel against a 20% drop in pump prices in Kenya. You take that crude oil, you have to refine it, you have to put it on a ship and transport it and then bring it here. So you are not going to get that direct shilling for shilling effect. The products, even if we were to start bringing them today, will only arrive here after that 10 to 45 days. That's why the prices we are announcing today would have been in the market over the last one and a half months. The stakeholders are also quoting the downward trend of the shilling against the dollar as a worrying factor that has the potential to cause price hikes in the future. And with the falling pump prices, inflation has continued on a downward trend since September last year to close 2014 at 6.02%, though the transport index has held firm. Fuel prices are coming down for seven months running now, and unfortunately users of public transport are yet to feel this drop. We were hoping that now the Matatu owners can at least reduce the prices because really people who use the Matatus who commute, it's really hard for them. It is the hope of both consumers and other stakeholders that the drop in pump prices will trickle down to them as manufacturers and service providers review the prices of their goods downwards in respect to lower production and operating costs. Charles Gitonga, KTN. Well, a lot of relief for consumers there. In a move set to spur cheaper credit, the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee has revised the banking reference rate from 9.13% to 8.54%. This signals a desire for lower lending rates by the regulator. With more monetary tools at its disposal, the MPC retained the central bank rate at 8.5%, the same level it has been at since April 2013. The move by the central bank to lower the banking reference rate to 8.5% was keenly anticipated as demand for credit slowed down last year. The new rate pegged is likely to push banks to revise their lending rates on loans, which have averaged 16%. The central bank introduced the KBRR in July last year as a tool to make loan pricing more transparent, giving borrowers an option to choose which lender to use. The high cost of loans is seen as a hindrance to economic growth as it discourages businesses and households from borrowing while also pushing those with debts into defaults. The review marks the first revision since the Kenya Bank's reference rate was introduced six months ago for use by commercial banks to price loan products. The next review is scheduled for July unless shocks hit the economy. The decision to lower the banking reference rate was welcomed by various analysts, according to Standard Chartered Bank's head of research, Razia Khan. 
The move is likely to ease the pressure on short-term yields and support the government's ambitious economic growth targets. CBK and the Kenya Bankers Association have been on a charm offensive to bring down interest rates. The purpose of setting the bank reference rate is to help reduce interest rates by making the cost of loans transparent across different banks. It has, however, failed to cut lending rates, leaving banks to report double-digit profit growth, mainly driven by high spreads. Abiyagina, KTN Business. Well, moving on to Nakuru County, the governor of Nakuru County, Kinuthi Mbugwa, and his Nyandarwa counterpart, Waidhaka Mwangi, have taken the fight against illegal packaging of potatoes to the roads. In an overnight operation along the Naivasha Maimahiu and the Nairobi Nakuru highways, over 50 trucks were nabbed for flouting the 50 kg packaging law. The two counties have vowed to bring sanity in the sector that tricks an estimated 5 billion shillings annually. The enforcement comes as part of the Agricultural Food and Fisheries Act came into place. The act stipulates how farm produce should be packaged. While addressing the press, Mbugwe said 12 potato growing counties had agreed to work together and make sure that the act was fully enforced. The governor hit out at middlemen for the continued exploitation of farmers, adding that some few traders had failed to comply with the act. Farmers are very happy because this was their own request. The farmers are generally very happy about this move. They have no problem with it, but we have problem with the middlemen who want uh, that, that the measure remain as it was traditional so that they can make uh, more profit out of this. There is a group of Kenyans who are sworn never to allow the farmer to enjoy his sweat. Those are the brokers, the traders and the middlemen. We are here today, we are here tonight at this ungodly hour to tell them we shall follow the law. And now to some corporate news. Beverage maker Coca-Cola has launched a personalized marketing campaign geared to boosting sales of its flagship product, Coke. Under the Share a Coke Kenya campaign, the soft drinks company selects popular Kenyan names and prints them on Coke soda bottles and cans. With an infinite number of uniquely Kenyan names, the campaign is geared to having consumers buy products with their names or those of friends and have them exchange bottles. So far, the company has printed over 200 of the most common names. And to another story where the trade summit organized by Kenya and Dubai is actually happening and it is scheduled to happen in April. Here is what one of the leaders that is organizing for this trade summit had to say. The investment meeting, the fifth edition, will be focusing on uh, a new theme, which is a sustainable development through FDI, technology transfer, and in innovation. Opportunity of a lifetime that uh, anybody else, anybody who has a company, anybody who has an idea, anybody who has a business, to try, reach out, and expose the ideas and businesses out there, because there are people who are waiting and willing to join hands. A very good evening and welcome to today's edition of KTN Sports. My name is Moses Wahisi. Now starting on a football gear. Football Kenya Federation will move to the official resident at the goal project in the first week of February. FIFA's Regional Development Officer Ashford Mamelodi inspected the project that was rehabilitated at a cost of over 25 million Kenyan shillings and saves for some few renovations the Federation has got a go ahead and is set to move in the Nyaya offices. After pumping in over 25 million shillings, the gold project is finally ready for occupation. The Federation has been operating from a small office at the Nyayo National Stadium, and according to Ashford Bamelodi, FIFA was not amused, having built these offices but were neglected and run down. It has always been a concern that um, these premises were not occupied, and we understood why they were not occupied, because at the time they were not habitable. After discussions with FIFA, we agree that we have to renovate this uh, um, facility. We don't have to be spending money when we have our own facility. It has taken about uh, one and a half months to 
do this work. There was practically nothing. The place was vandalized and run down. When we visited the place, workers were putting up the perimeter fence, finalizing on the kitchen while the offices are ready and what is remaining is the dormitories and the parking bay. We are occupying the place and we intend to occupy this place before the end of this month or let's say first week of next month. We are supposed to do the next phase, which is uh, the hostels. Mm -hmm. uh, that might take us uh, about a month. Okay. So by the end of, uh, by mid February, we are supposed to hand over. There are plans to build two stadia near the facility in the near future. Ha, St. Juma, KTN Sports. And still in matters of soccer. The existing row between the Football Kenya Federation and the Kenya Premier League on an expanded 18 teams league and the Super Sport uh, uh, contractual agreement rather will be sorted out by the World Football Governing Body. FIFA representatives have been meeting members of the FKF, KPL and the Super Sports and also Tasca with a view to sort out this helmet. The findings are expected in less than a fortnight. We cannot discuss about it now because the process is on and you are aware that FIFA had sent a consultant who is, who is on uh, discussion and ongoing. So you let us give it time so that we can come up and uh, comprehensively tell you when the exercise is over. Mm -hmm. The league should start as quickly as possible. We don't intend to prolong the league. We, 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 are, we are in the process of making sure that this matter is finalized before the league takes, uh, takes off in the next uh, the second week of, uh, of, 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 of February. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see if it will be a, a 16-team uh, league or an 18-team league. And to matters of hockey now. After failing to sparkle in a number of international assignments, the Kenya national women's hockey team is geared up to have a good outing during this year's World Hockey League in Uruguay. The team currently trains at City Park and uh, the players are driven to bring international glory to Kenya. Robinson Kenya reports. The national women's hockey team has previously failed to leave a lasting mark on the international scene. There has been a distinct contrast in performance between Kenyan clubs and the national team, despite the fact that the clubs are the national team feeders in terms of players. Kenyan clubs have ruled Africa for almost a decade now. The national team, however, hopes to turn their fortunes around during the World Hockey League participation, where they knocked out Ghana to qualify for the Round 2 finals in Uruguay. The Queens now feel they have what it takes to bring international glory to Kenya. I believe that uh, we have a team that is capable and uh, wait and see what's going to happen. We are not going there just to participate, but we're going to prove to Kenya that we really deserve a place in the World Cup. Well, we started a long time ago. We had the tournament in November, so the team is ready. So we just have, we are putting in place the, the, the final details. Kenya failed to qualify for the World Cup, and despite criticism on the hockey standards in the country, coach Joseph Penda says his charges are ready to shine. They look at it, we've just been playing against African teams. We've not played outside, outside Europe. So I cannot say that we are not up to the game. This is the first time we are going there, and we are going to see how we can prove that actually all the doubting Thomas is wrong, that we are capable to play against them. Kenya has been placed in the same pool with European World Hockey League Round 1 champions France, Caribbean winners Trinidad and Tobago and Azerbaijan. Kenya, which is ranked 44th by the International Hockey Federation, qualified for the World Hockey League 2 tournament after winning the Round 1 tournament that was held in Nairobi against African opponents Ghana and Tanzania. As the national women's hockey team intensify their training, one thing tops the agenda, bringing home the World's League 2 crown. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports. Thank you, Robinson, for that piece. And let's hope that the Kenyan uh, hockey queens will sparkle. Now, moving on. Despite stepping up as a late host for the 2015 Africa Cup of Nations, and that's obviously after Morocco's withdrawal, Equatorial Guinea has made numerous strides in just less than two months. The local organizing committee has assured participants that the country has put uh, structures into place to manage the dreadful Ebola virus. Equatorial Guinea is gearing up to host the 2015 Africa Cup of Nations in just under three days. The country was a last minute standing after Morocco was stripped of the right to host the event when the country said it wanted to postpone the tournament due to fears over the Ebola epidemic. At the time, Morocco said it didn't have the infrastructure to handle such a situation and it's not any different in Equatorial Guinea. 
crois qu'on n'est pas outillé et je vois mal. I don't think we are equipped and I don't think any country is equipped to handle the security and checks on so many people. Non, c'est important que ça. Equatorial Guinea is however confident it can handle the challenge ahead. The small country nestled between Cameroon and Gabon has so far managed to steer clear of the Ebola virus that has infected more than 20,000 people in Western Africa. The government says that strict precautionary measures will be in place as teams arrive from across the continent. We are going to follow the guidelines of the World Health Organization as prevention is at the heart of what the National Committee of Ebola Vigilance in Equatorial Guinea is doing. All visitors will have their temperatures tested as soon as they disembark from their planes in the capital Malabo. There are plans for three isolation units to be built for people suspected of carrying the disease and the Guinean government has recruited 50 Cuban doctors for prevention purposes. So far, this strategy has paid off and despite the presence of the virus in West Africa, no country or player has refused to take part in the championship. In Morocco, life is going on as normal with residents not appearing bothered by the fact that the Northern African country missed out on a huge opportunity to welcome the whole continent to their backyard. With the Moroccan national team also not taking part in the competition, it's not clear if the country will be following the Africa Cup of Nations. Lynn Washira, KTN Sports. Thank for being a part of KTN Prime this evening. It was a pleasure to have you. Meresha Owiti was our sign language interpreter. And I'm Masika Chungiro. We've got Jeff Koenang coming up next. Absolutely, and time to look forward to very low fuel prices. It's, it's, I'm still getting my You're head You're very off. happy about that, Absolutely, you? absolutely. <laughs> this just means basically that, you know, the life, the, the uh, cost of living comes down, the fare comes down. Yes, so it's, it's a great thing. All around, All around. great news. <laughs> well, sleep well. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.